Now let's get back to Kenya where technology once again is helping this country in East Africa to turn tragedy into opportunity. Now that has been amply demonstrated after the leading mobile telecommunication operators and non-governmental organizations all started to coordinate an enormous fundraising effort to cover the cost of emergency responses to Kenya's current crisis over at the Westgate Mall. Mobile operators Safaricom, Airtel and Orange opened up new pay bill numbers on mobile money platforms like M-Pesa, enabling the crowdsourcing of funds popularly known in Kenya as Harambe. Now, according to operators, donations from both corporates and individuals have been absolutely instrumental in raising funds. Now, donations do range from about 10 shillings, that's roughly about 1 US cent, to about 50,000 shillings or about 580 US dollars. Total funds raised so far, just before we came into the bulletin, was about 41 million shillings. That's just under half a million US dollars. Now, the effort aims to raise double that amount in total. The funds are expected to go towards clearing hospital bills, covering the cost of running emergency vehicles and medical costs as well. We're now, of course, being informed that we're now raising an average of $500 a minute on the M-Pesa platform. That's about 34,000 shillings, which is quite an amount here in Kenya. At the same time, Kenyan police have heightened security around the country in order to keep businesses running as normal following the weekend terror attack, which does continue to carry on in Nairobi's Westgate Mall. The country's cabinet secretary in charge of commerce and tourism has described this as an isolated incident, and she says it will not affect businesses in the rest of the country. She also adds that the police are fully in charge of security right across Kenya. Hoteliers attending an investment forum in the Kenyan capital condemned the event, but they said they would not hold back their investment plans. Last-minute preparations for the Africa Hotel and Investment Forum in Nairobi. Over 2,000 delegates are expected here on Tuesday, and organizers say that the forum will proceed as planned. Very fortunately for us, um, you would expect some cancellations from something like that, but the rate of cancellations is less than 10%. Uh, all the main uh, big uh, speakers and big uh, business leaders uh, are all coming, uh, so we're very uh, buoyed up by that. Tourism is a leading honor of foreign exchange for East Africa's largest economy. It's the sector that's likely to be hardest hit by the terrorist incident. With Nairobi a key regional economic and travel hub, analysts expect the long-term impact to remain limited. It's not a reason not to, to, to invest in Africa. We actually, as I said before, we believe this is the exact opposite. This is, if we want not, that not to happen again, we should make sure that uh, investment comes. And uh, we are pretty sure that a lot of investors uh, will still invest in Africa. For instance, uh, when we're expecting to, uh, to invest 315 million uh, euros in Africa with our projects, and it's a huge amount, and uh, we will not take away one euro uh, after what happened. Of course not. Actually, that's, that pushes us to do even more if possible. Unfortunately, my, my uh, sister was um, involved in, the, uh, was actually captured uh, and was stuck in the, in the Westgate shopping centre for three, three and a half hours. By God's grace and God's intervention, uh, she managed to escape. Um, so to me, this is a very personal matter. Uh, but from a, from a business point of view, you know, uh, you've got to be optimistic and you've got to show your support. And I'm here to support, show my support for, for the event and for the economy of Kenya as well. The country has not suffered any travel advisories following the incident. However, the government has been at pains to reassure foreigners and citizens alike of their security. I would like to assure the tourists that have already booked uh, their, their, their um, holidays in Kenya not to cancel, but to continue to come because Kenya is peaceful. This is an isolated incident that is just happening in one very small part of Nairobi. And the security forces are actually ensuring that they've condoned the area. Travel and tourism account for up to 12.5% of Kenya's gross domestic product and up to 11% of total employment. The Kenyan government is hoping to come out of this incident stronger if it is to sustain economic growth to meet its ambitious development agenda. Peter Kaba, CCTV. Now, obviously, investors and other watchers of the Kenyan economy are only just getting to grips with what the long-term effects of the current tragedy at Westgate will be. Though it's still fairly early in the day, our correspondent Kelly Lemon did speak to investors and analysts in the World Financial Centre of London. She's now live over there with some feedback on what they think about what's going on in East Africa's largest economy. Uh, Kelly, of course, a key issue from the Kenyan government is let's not have travel advisories issued against this 
economy in East Africa. Are countries like the United Kingdom likely to cooperate? Well, as it stands, the UK Foreign Office is advising against all but essential travel to parts of Nairobi and a stretch of land alongside Kenya's border with Somalia. But there are no alerts in place for the rest of the country. And what that means is that anybody travelling to the country wouldn't be entitled to a refund if they cancel their trip, unless it's in the specific places mentioned. Now, earlier we spoke to ABTA, which represents travel agents in the UK. They say this isn't really impacting those travelling to the country, as most trips either don't include Nairobi or the visit is limited and can be rescheduled and they insist the disruption is minimal. Now, Kenyan officials are also echoing this and have confirmed two major investment conferences will go ahead in Nairobi this week as planned. And the UK Foreign Office has confirmed four British people have been killed in the attacks. Indeed. Is there any concern, however, on your side of the world that this attack may in some way curtail FDI flows into Kenya's economy? Well, in the immediate reaction, we are seeing investors take a cautious stance. Kenya's shilling weakened and shares and firms popular with foreign investors are also suffering. But analysts in London say this is likely to be a short-term reaction. And in terms of new money, this attack is a concern, especially when it comes to tourism. Just last week, Kenya's tourism board forecast a 10% jump in visitor numbers in the 2013-2014 fiscal year. Now, after a relatively peaceful election this year, authorities are pleased with increased visitor numbers and rebuilding the country image as a stable democracy and at this stage it's too soon to tell the long-term implications. Indeed finally though although we are essentially looking into the crystal ball here this attack also did target businesses that deal specifically with affluent personalities and the expatriate community here in Kenya. What's the long-term outlook for those particular sectors moving forward? Well, at this stage, analysts aren't expecting this isolated event to drastically impact Kenya's tourism industry, an industry that is the country's biggest income earner after agriculture. And in fact, Kenya earned just over 96 billion shillings during the last fiscal year. So it's important the country remains open for business, and that's the message that's feeding through to the international community. Now, the British Foreign Office say just under 200,000 visitors enjoyed trouble-free trips to the country in 2012, and travel operators are stressing that this is a very specific attack in a specific area. Now, earlier this year, a German airline announced its plans to increase the amount of direct flights to Kenya, aiming to take an additional 8,000 passengers to the country per year. But yes, of course, the images appearing around the world will hurt Kenya's tourism efforts. But officials hope that the damage at this stage will be limited. Indeed. We'll have to leave it there for the time being. Thank you very much for that feedback. That's CCTV's Kelly Lemon live in London. Let's move on to Ethiopia now. Its booming gold industry is in a relatively bright spot in an otherwise depressed global sector, especially if you have South Africa in mind. High growth over the past five years has seen quite the surge in income as foreign and domestic mining companies join Africa's newest gold rush. CCTV's Girum Chala has the story from Addis Ababa. The Horn of Africa country is known for its coffee. But a gold rush over the last two years has seen export rise to 24,000 kilograms and earnings shot up to 1.2 billion US dollars. Government officials say prospects for the gold mining sector can only get brighter. The ministry manages the production of gold mining in two ways. The first is the type of gold produced in a factory level where huge amounts of investment is made for. The second is the one produced traditionally, and both are going pretty well. A recent survey increased estimates of gold resources to 500 tons. The government says production could rise to 40 tons a year from just over 4 tons two years ago. More production will mean less dependence on imports and a boost of foreign currency earnings. The government wants to maximize gold production in its 2020-2022 vision term to 2 billion US dollars, which is 10 times what the country had in 2012. And this directly or indirectly has big contribution to the nation's economy. But challenges remain. Of the hundreds of companies licensed to mine gold, only 130 are in operation. The sector is also in need of huge investment. 
Most of the investors take licenses, but they delay when actually implementing the project itself. They face challenges like capital, technology, and human resource that prevented them from starting up the investment. The future appears bright for Ethiopian gold exports. The anticipation of this, the government has projected annual revenues of a billion dollars a year over the next five years. Ethiopia's gold mining success promises a big boost for the country's economy. It's a golden outlook that could be unlocked by better regulation and increased investment. Grumjala, CCTV, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Now it's just about a quarter to the top of the hour. Here's what's coming up next on Biz Africa. Nigeria and South Africa, they take the lead in generating media and entertainment revenues. We'll be looking at steps to grow the sector across the continent when we come back. Asia. Asia means business. Now let's move on to North Africa where Egypt is planning to soon reach an agreement to repay over six billion dollars in outstanding debts to international oil and gas companies. It aims to make those payments, at least the first one, before the year is over. One of the options being discussed right now is for foreign companies to raise their output of crude and compensate inside Egypt. The companies then export their share of that increased production as repayment for some of the cash owed. Some of the companies Egypt owes cash to include British Petroleum, Apache Corporation, BG Group and Dana Gas, an energy company based in the United Arab Emirates. Now, the North African country has been paying some pretty hefty premiums for its crude supplies due to the weaker Egyptian pound and it is struggling to pay off its debt to foreign energy companies as well. Still in Egypt, though, the North African country has returned about $2 billion to Qatar as relations between the two Arab countries remain relatively frosty following the military overthrow of Egyptian leader Mohamed Morsi. Hesham Ramez, the head of Egypt's central bank, says a cash was returned after Qatar asked officials to postpone the conversion of the funds to bonds as earlier agreed. Now, over the past year, Qatar supported the government of the former Egyptian president, Mohamed Morsi, with some $8 billion worth of aid. After his departure, however, concerns have been raised as to whether Egypt would have to repay any of the cash it was given. Qatar, so far, has been sidelined by Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and the UAE, all of which have promised and delivered part of about $12 billion in aid to Egypt. Now, compared to the rest of the globe, the size of Africa's entire entertainment market is relatively small. But the sector does continue to attract quite a bit of intense interest. And a recent study was undertaken to assess the potential size of the industry in three key African countries. Now, while the results of the study seems to be unsurprising, it did reveal that business opportunities there are endless. Angelo Coppola reports on a sector that holds nearly endless possibility, quite literally, for African economies. South Africa's E&M sector is expected to generate around $19 billion in 2017. Nigeria's market will exceed $9 billion, while Kenya will be around $3 billion. The key drivers for all three, in fact, are internet access and more specifically mobile access. So the growth that we see on mobile internet subscribers is what's going to drive the access to e &M content, and this will drive the industry completely. Entertainment and media consumption habits are changing, and it's not age-related. I use my iPad, my phone, 
my Samsung tablet and my um, laptop. And that extends to how I buy my media, to how I buy my music, how I buy my my books. It is very easy, like just get it by a mobile phone, like you can get anything, sports, news, entertainment, also the movies too. There's my newspaper. It's only a newspaper I have. And for companies that are agile and develop a business model that will work in this environment, there's a lot of opportunity. South African company Kahiso Media seems to have got the recipe right. It recently released financials which showed a jump of 39% in revenue, operating profit up 9%, while headline earnings per share were 168 cents compared to 135 cents last year. So you actually don't have a choice because you know even customers themselves who are looking from an ad spend point of view, because of the digital environment, they're finding it easier to design content and campaigns that they can go direct to the consumer market rather than going through the traditional channels which they've done before. People are consuming their media and entertainment in different ways, but it seems that the move to online and to the mobile is where it's all happening. And if you're an investor or a business, this is where you should be looking. I'm Angelo Coppola for CCTV in Johannesburg. All right, now, quick run through the markets. Despite the news we've come out with, especially with regard to Egypt, of course, returning some of the money they got from Qatar in the past, different story coming through the markets, at least as far as the EJX is concerned. The All Share Index in Nigeria ending the day higher by almost three tenths. The All Share Index in South Africa, however, in the red, down 0.15%. The 20 Share Index in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi, as we mentioned earlier, of course, taking quite the beating, of course, from the news that we have right now, the ongoing siege at Westgate. The Kenyan currency also dropping lower. That was down by a quarter. The EJX 30, however, putting some of the highest gains so far today up by over one percentage point. The macro data on the uh, economic side notwithstanding. On to the sports now with Beatrice. Rama, many thanks indeed. Well, time for the sports. Your headline.